everyone. Welcome back to Business Storytelling with Artem Wyshyn Makedonski. We have a special guest tonight, Jeff Mead, amazing expert on storytelling and uh, leadership, author of Coming Home to Story and uh, the book I Know You By, Jeff, uh, Jeff uh, which is telling the story, the heart and soul of successful mm -hmm. leadership. Uh, he is the, the man who is working with the notion narrative leadership, which is, I guess, essential for the modern world given the things we're going through right now. So Jeff, thank you so much for joining me today. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm looking forward to it. Great. So um, Jeff, as a starter, can you tell me uh, about what leadership means to you? Like, mm, are the leaders born or you can become one? What's your views on this highly, uh, highly liked topic today? I often say to people that I'm not very interested in leadership. <laughs> uh, in fact, after th I've 30 years, I've been working in the leadership development world, and yeah. I've decided that leadership doesn't mean anything. It's an abstract noun. Okay. <laughs> I'm <a> very, <laughs> very interested when we, we speak of leading, when we turn it from an abstract noun into a verb. So for me, uh, you have to use the word leadership as a figure. It's really about a practice, it's uh -huh. something we do. And leading is something that uh, anyone can do. It's not the exclusive preserve of a few people who are leaders and they lead people who are followers. So in my view of the world, um, leading is a practice. Wow. And I decided, I, I came to the conclusion a long time ago when I thought about, you know, what is it we're talking about when we talk about people leading? I think there are lots of aspects, but one of them, I think, a significant aspect, very significant, is that when we're leading, trying to make meaning, we're trying to make meaning in complex, sometimes difficult circumstances with other people, sometimes for other people. And when I bumped into storytelling some 20 odd years ago, I had this kind of insight or this, this realization that actually story is the primary way that humans as a species, not as a culture, from, you know, it's, it's completely ubiquitous, it's everywhere in the world. As a, as a species, story is the primary way, it's how we give meaning and significance to our lives. Mm. So if we're leading, if we're trying to make sense and, and uh, share that sense making, then I think people who have you know, the, the job of being a leader, who are called leaders, have a particular responsibility to understand how stories work and to use them responsibly. Great. That's, does that, that's does that make sense? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you just, you just led me to it, pun intended. And yeah, mm. I, I love it that you view leadership as, a, as, a, as something that everyone can do. And I, I mm. love this notion by Simon, Simon Sinek who says a leader is someone who just has a follower. So basically everyone can become a leader. And I love mm. how you focus on the leading it's it's a different aspect great yeah. uh, so you yeah. you've mentioned that it was 20 some years ago and uh my, ne my next question really fits uh, this quite well did you have some kind of aha moment when you came to the idea that storytelling and leadership like are i did <laughs> <laughs> i did yes i did it was very strange i i've um had a prior career to my current one. Well, currently, I work as an academic and as a teacher, uh -huh. as a consultant, as a writer, and as a storyteller. Uh -huh. But I had a 30-year career in the United Kingdom Police Service. I was uh -huh. a, a policeman and a senior policeman, and I ran uh, leadership programs within the police service. That's what I did for several years. Yeah. So I was very, I've been very interested in leading and leadership and what it, how you can help people kind of become how you can help people lead in a way that is truer to their values and lead thoughtfully. I've been thinking about that and trying to practice that work for many years. And I went to a conference in, I think it was 1996. It was sort of mid late nineties. Uh, it was a technical conference. It was about uh, complexity theory and organizational development. Mm -hmm. It was a three day, three day event. And on the second night, the organizers had arranged 
for two professional storytellers, performers, to come mm. in and tell traditional stories. Mm -hmm. And I had no interest whatsoever in going. <laughs> I thought, you know, stories, this is for kids. You know, I'm grown up. So I went to the bar. <laughs> I went to the bar. And um, not for the first or the last time, found myself the only person there. And I ordered my glass of wine. And I said to the barman, where is everyone? And he said, well, they're next door in the lounge waiting for the story show. So I thought, oh, God, I said, well, there's nothing else to do. I'd better go. <laughs> so I went, in, <laughs> I went into this room and there were armchairs and sofas. And it was quite crowded with people from the conference. And there wasn't quite enough room. So people were sitting on the floor, leaning against armchairs. You know, it looked like, a, it looked like um, play school. It looked like a kindergarten. <laughs> getting ready for the story. And I was pretty um, cynical about it i thought yeah 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 yes. yeah one, gonna, one one would yeah, be yeah. really <laughs> yeah, i was and uh, i sat there and i was expecting as i looked around other people to be kind of you know a bit cynical too but there wasn't it was a kind of warmth in the room yeah. and then uh two guys both of whom i came to know very well subsequently um middle-aged guys ex-hippies like myself actually <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so I, one of them began to tell a traditional story uh -huh. and I do mention it in telling the story in the, in, in the book it yeah. was uh, uh, from a tradition of Buddhist stories uh, about the reincarnation of the Buddha in the form of a deer and suddenly I mean within 30 seconds a minute I found myself against my better judgment kind of leaning forward on the seat thinking what's what's going to happen now what's happening next and i was i felt a bit embarrassed i thought i imagined that i was the only person who'd been caught and i kind of <laughs> looked left and right and i saw everyone in the room was kind of <gasps> <laughs> and i thought this is extraordinary so i had this dual attention i was absolutely caught with the story i could hear the sounds i could it was about hunting and and uh, these deer were slaughtered many of them and i i could almost taste the blood it was so visceral wow. and yet it was just this guy standing up using ordinary language in a particular kind of way to bring something alive and he brought it alive in the room in in me in my mind and also in my body because i could feel it yeah and in the minds and hearts and bodies of the p other people in the room so we were kind of connecting to the story and the storyteller, but we also kind of, kind of connected as a, as a temporary community. Something brought us together as we sat in and listened uh, to this story. Mm. And I thought, this is extraordinary. This is amazing. And as the evening went on, and there were maybe half a dozen stories, I loved them. I just kind of fell in love with storytelling. And... Um, uh, the, in fact, at the end of the evening, I, so I, couldn't, I couldn't wait to applaud. I rushed up to them, and, and this guy, whose name is Ashley Ramsden, who became my teacher, mm. I kind of grabbed hold of him. I said, I've got to learn how to do this. No. Uh, but uh, very early on, I thought, wow. You know, I had myself had been you know, a, sen a senior policeman. I'd, I'd been in leadership roles. I had, you know, had to kind of rally the troops. I'd been addressing communities. I knew what it was to stand up and try and get the attention and hearts and minds of people yeah and and here were these guys doing it actually doing it and i was incredibly excited i thought i didn't know what i didn't know what was important i just knew there was something really important going on that i had to learn about and so i began to to learn about story so i began to go on weekends and then week-long courses and then eventually uh when i left the police service in 2002 i went on a full-time training for three and a half months uh, as residential training as a storyteller. Wow. And then for a while, I took a kind of career break. I went out and I just, I told stories in church halls, in schools, in village halls, just to, I really wanted to learn it from the inside out. So I could not just talk about it, but do it. Mm. So I could be the one, I knew what it took to stand in the front of a group of people. And subsequently I've told stories at international festivals and you know, a theater full of people. I know what it's like to be on the stage and really work with a group of people and share a story. I understand it from the inside out. And that felt really important. I had this hunch about yeah. that there was a connection. I didn't know what it was, 
But as I became more proficient at storytelling, as I understood the craft of it and what it, what, how it was working, I was also reading into it, you know, theoretically around it, around story yeah. and narrative and narrative identity and, you know, um, Jerome Brunner on the story. Yeah, narrative. I loved it. I began to understand that stuff. And then I began gradually to make connections with my other practice, which was how I earned my living, which was by running programs around leading and leadership. And, and I began to try and experiment and introduce little elements of it into these programs. And it took me a long while to work out how to do it really effectively. Yeah. Um, you know, and I gradually built a practice around that work. And, you know, the book that we mentioned, the yellow one, the telling the story really is the kind of fruit of about 15 years of practice of taking the work out into the world with yeah. different groups of people and, and testing my ideas out and, and trying to create a form that was uh, understandable and helpful. Wow. That's, you know, to tell the truth, I, I've read about this story in the book and uh, yeah. I, I, I thought that you were going to mention this experience, but it really feels really different when you're telling it face to face. It's, it's really, yeah. as you said, visceral. I can feel it, this like hatred to the people. <laughs> the I, I, really, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. So, I'm so into it. You're, you're a master. That's, that's, just, that's just my masterpiece. Wow. That's, that's kind of you. Thank you. <laughs> you're, you're most welcome. Um, <laughs> Jeff, since you're working with uh, leadership and storytelling, mm. I would like to see, hear your views on why do you think there's such a fuss and the vibe around the term leadership and leading, like all those notions that you mentioned, about, like uh, focused leadership, charismatic leadership, whatever else leadership. Mm. Why, why so many? Well, mm. Why? It's a very good question, and I'm not sure I've got any more than a, uh, a you know, a guess as to why. Um, if I think about it, I, I, I would say there. Are, so here's an attempt to answer your question. I think yeah. there are at least two strands of things going on. Mm -hmm. One is that um, it's a form of <laughs> it's it's something that within the academy, within business schools and universities. Um, they talk about the narrative turn. So there's a broader uh, shift, um, put on, putting on my academic hat for a minute, mm -hmm. an epistemological shift in the way that we think about how meaning is made. Uh -huh. And in the social sciences, there's been a shift over the last 20 years or so from um, kind of assuming that uh, numerical data gives you answers to actually the real, the real depth of answer or the real depth of understanding lies in the stories from which that data is drawn. Mm -hmm. So in the academy as a whole, there's been what they call the narrative turn, a shift to, to thinking differently about how we make meaning. So there's a, there's a broader movement intellectually yeah. that, that, that is around. Now, then you've got the fact that I suppose it becomes something very recently, it's become fashionable. And when I started to take storytelling into organizations 15 years ago, I would knock on the door and say, hello, I'm a storyteller, can I help you? <laughs> <laughs> they would say, not today, thank you. Huh. Um, you know, these days, there's, a, there's a, a demand for storytelling. I'm asked to go in and do things. Now, I think, I think what the parallel strand is, and I talk about, you know, in terms of telling the story, this notion of, of story operating at the level of the self and of the community and of the wider world. I think uh, some of the bigger stories through the, the lenses through which we see the world uh, are breaking down. They're not working. And they worked for a while. There was a post-World post War II, there was a kind of a period of relative, relative stability. Yeah. And we kind of forgot that the way that we see the world is a construction. We, ch we talk about the world in particular ways. You, know, you can construe the world uh, as was the case in your country through a communist lens. You can construe it through a capitalist lens. Yeah. And you can forget that it's a lens. You think it's the real, you think it's reality. You think it's a description of something that is objectively real. But when things start to break down, you see that it's not an objective reality. It's a way of seeing the world. Yeah. So, you, I mean, you could say that in the West, um, we have uh, acted for the last 150 years or so, big statement, 
maybe you know in the industrial and post-industrial world as if the industrial growth society were fixed immutable and objectively real mm. the only way to do something but we see that it's only one of many ways because of the consequences you know we have huge environmental degradation massive species loss climate change in the west massive differentials in in wealth and poverty so it's we're hurting and then we have to say is there another story and so the thing becomes more explicit the fact that we are storing our world becomes more explicit and then we have an interest then in in how do we consciously um play into that space if we understand it to be a a space of contested narratives then one of the things we need to do is is to promote the narratives that we believe in and yeah. so, so it's not a complicated answer to your question but there's several no, it's, things it's, there's, yeah it's, there's the broader sh shift in in intellectual shift there's the fact that it, 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 with you know we mustn't forget that universities are also an industry and and business you know business schools where this stuff is taught a lot and i teach a business school a part of the industry it's a it's become a saleable product but i think there's also this other dimension to it which is mm. there's a much greater awareness of the fact that we story our world into existence uh, mm. because because the stories are so are more um visible to us we see that you know because they don't they're not working as well as they used to mm. So I think basically what I hear is uh, the demand to make sense of our reality is uh, basically met, fr met from the world with the attempt from the leaders to learn the storytelling process and not only like make sense for people, but make it with the people so that we can yeah. adapt to this shift that's going on. Is that right? Yes, and I think I, I think that's right, but I, and I think that's long been the case, but it's not uh -huh. really been visible. We haven't thought of it in that way. Harold Gardner wrote, no, not Howard Gardner, wrote a very good book called Leading Minds. It's, it's oh a yeah, old, old book, you know. Yeah, and you know, love it. He looks at various historical figures, and you can see how what they're doing is kind of creating a particular story and inviting people to find a place in that story. And he makes the point. I think I got it from him. You know, it's always a contested space. But yeah. sometimes some people in those leadership roles kind of name something that is kind of yearned for and, and they put it in a way that people can understand, respond to, and it's a kind of story. Mm -hmm. But I think the whole, but it, it wasn't really thought of in those terms at, at the time. We, now we look at it through that narrative lens, you see exactly what's going on. Yeah, after, just, after the events are gone. Yeah, we're more conscious of the lens. We've always looked through the lens. And it's like, it's like I've got, I wear glasses. Um, I forget that I've got them on. Mm. And it's like society has had this pair of glasses on called narrative and has forgot that it wears mm. them. But now we're interested in the, yeah. the glasses as well as what we see. So we're, wow, that, that, really, uh, that really makes me understand how the global movements such as you know like the free speech or the anti-racism stuff is going on because that's that's just basically people looking at their glasses yeah 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 that's that's yeah. just that's some some you know the, the people who are defining the leadership and the leader uh, they are like on this level but this this stuff we're talking in right now is like something with the meaning and i love it thank you um you know i, I think it's ubiquitous yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. It's a very, very, um, very neat word to describe it. And, you know, I, I would love to return to this upper level with the storytelling, because uh, I see now a sure. lot of literature about storytelling and like uh, Paul Smith, I guess you're familiar. He has uh, his new book out, which is uh, 10x, I guess, 10 stories every leader should tell. And there was this leader with the story and Stephen Denning had his great leadership through storytelling. And what I see in yeah. many books is this part with structure, which is also presented in your book. And I love the castle metaphor for it, like this acronym. And what other yeah. thing I see is that people describe stories for some tasks, like stories for strategy, stories for 
I don't know, uh, yeah, change yeah. Management, stories yeah. for vision. And I have a two sided yeah. question. Is that a good thing or should we just focus on the story itself? That's one part. And a question from a fan of yours from here. Um, what stories should we tell or are there any to get to help our team get through tough times? So two, two part of <laughs> questions. Yeah. So just, just tease us apart. Those Sorry? questions. Yeah. Let me just, let me just give, give them to you. First one is, uh, are there any types of stories for a leader and is it even a good or bad thing? Like, can we, can we, have, can we evaluate it from your experience? That's the first part. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, uh, I don't really like recipes and formulas very much. I mean, uh -huh. the, 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 the castle method is a way of just composing and constructing a story. It's a technical device. For yeah. Yeah. But in terms of what stories to tell, I have to, and I, it's, a, it's a very simple and used almost cliche metaphor. I talk about the tree, you know, the oh, yeah. roots of the tree, the roots of the tree stretch down and, and we, we have to come to know who we are and what we, what we really care about. You know, what, mm -hmm. What's true for me? What am I bringing? Not what I think I ought to believe, but what do I really believe is valuable and important in the world? The, the, the branches, the leaves, if you like, uh, the breathing part of the tree that reaches out. What are we listening to? What stories does the world need? need? You know, what's, what's really going on? And where do, that, where do those two things meet? In the trunk. Um, I think Parker Palmer talked about um, calling as being mm. where the world's need meets our deep longing. You know, wh where is that space? And somewhere there's the trunk, and that's what we stand for. Yeah. And you can't stand for, you know, you, you can't just stand for anything you like. It has to have some truth in it. Uh, I think one of the problem with formulas for stories for leaders to tell is there's a temptation to pluck one off the shelf. Mm. And, you, and it's not embodied. Mm. My whole take on leadership and storytelling is that it is exposing. Mm -hmm. if, if you are telling it to you, you are showing up. And you're showing yourself. I, I, I say in the book, you know, I've worked with, I don't know how many people I've worked with, hundreds, thousands, but, maybe, but certainly, certainly work quite closely with hundreds and hundreds of people. I've never met anyone I couldn't help tell a story if they wanted to. Hmm. I've met some who said, I'm not going there because to go there, I have to open this space a bit. I have to be vulnerable. Because mm -hmm. if you're telling a story about something that matters to you, showing yourself in a, in a human way to other people. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not, I, and I think if it's like, what story should I tell? Well, there is no simple answer to that. Um, but I think one of the things that we can do is open a, a space for stories to be shared and heard as well as told. So I think for every story a leader tells, they should listen to 10. Hmm. Uh, you know, there's something about um, in trouble times, we, it's, it's not that we necessarily want to be inspired by some single brilliant story. Yeah. We, we want to be confident that there is space for, you know, there is a place for our story. Can our story still be heard here? And how does my story and how I see my life fit into the vision you're painting mm -hmm. so for me it's that you know it's what story does what, a, what a, a, a leadership story does is open a different kind of space for a relationship mm. i'm i'm very, very suspicious of the inspirational although i can be moved by it you know it, it, it can catch me it can be moved but i'm i'm suspicious of the inspirational speech i like things mm. that are kind of fairly low-key um open down to earth and inviting, inviting mm -hmm. other people. I did yeah. a piece of work years ago with um, uh, a, t a global team from a big uh, oil company. Mm -hmm. And uh, they came together every couple of years, this, brought this group together, to just do some blue skies thinking and talk about people stuff. It was a, you know, just an investment in, in, in their, I suppose, in, in their health, their organization. And, I introduced them to the, this process called story circle, which is not one person telling a story, but a, a way, a structured way in which each person tells a story in relation to a theme or a trigger or an issue. Yeah. And they loved it. 
And on the third day, the chief executive came in to say, how are you getting on? And they had thought about what they wanted to do with the chief exec. And I said, well, no, I'm facilitating this, but really this is for you to manage. And they decided they wanted him to join a story circle. Yeah. So he set them, they, they explained the rules and they had the trick hat. Each of them, including him, had three minutes for the story. And for their three minutes storytelling, they each listened to another seven or eight three minute stories. And at the end of it, this, this chief exec said, that was amazing. He said, because I could hear, I could listen. There is so much expectation on me to fill the space, to tell you what to do. I, he said, I feel that expectation. And it was such a relief to, to be able to sit here in a contained way and, and listen. And for my voice, not to overrule everybody else's voice. Mm. So I like ways of using story that are kind of democratizing, that they're inviting people to show up uh, in their human capacity and in that way you know it's a profound act of leadership to do that but it's a particular kind of non-heroic leadership i'm not very interested in heroic leadership yeah i'm afraid that quite a lot of the literature is it promotes a particular western dare i say north american yeah, this... uh, <laughs> tough guy influenced the idea of, of the hero the leader's hero which is very masculine um very individualistic um very capitalistic and I think it kind of somehow misses the communitarian value of being, mm. hum being human together in this predicament, whatever it yeah. is. That's true. I love how you put it uh, that uh, the listening is also an approach valuable to the storyteller. And uh, oh. what you're saying is resonating on so many levels because I know the work of Mary Alice Arthur, who is she's specializing in creating the space like this art of hosting of hers and of course uh -huh. this uh, the, uh -huh. the murray nossel who is talking about the reciprocity between listening and telling i love how mm. expert storytellers are all focused on this very omitted part of storytelling which is basically listening to oh. the story and you oh. know uh jeff since we're and even yeah. even in the moment even when you're telling what? a story as a, as a storytelling, as a performer, for example, yeah, most of what you're doing is listening, even in the act of telling. Uh -huh. You're listening to the story as it comes through. You're listening and trying to absorb how it's landing with people. Yeah. And it, it's no good being skilled in a technical way and standing there and projecting this story unless you're open to both the story and to how it's landing even even in the act of telling you're you're listening wow that's that's a good one that's a good good way to put it jeff i would like to ask you a, a, a more technical question i am faced with the mm. as, as an interesting case right now uh i'm working with a medical company a pharmaceutical company and uh they have a problem with their tension uh because some people are some employees are getting uh, bought with higher salaries like you get 20 plus percent to raise and you like they buy you in and basically this is this is a crisis because they they cannot uh, like ap ap apply any benefits or anything else but they want to do something with retention and here's my question to you like if you had this situation with the client what would you do in in this leadership listening practice how would you organize it to help the leaders uh make the people stay and engage them into staying like oh interesting it's just yeah. off the top of I, my head I, so i have been, I think have, well, you know, no, I have all these organizations about i mean I, I suppose that it was fashionable to call it engagement you know having yeah <laughs> And that's half the right employee engagement. They, they would have engagement managers. And I said, if you've got someone to manage engagement, you've got a problem. <laughs> that's what we should be doing. Is, um, Good one. You know, it's what people are paid to do. Yeah. I think, I think that, you know, story is not the answer to everything. Yeah. So just going back to the very basic principles, you know, Maslow and the hierarchy of needs, we're going to, it's going to pay you a whole bunch more to go. Then it doesn't matter what you're going to think about it. So yeah. you have to kind of assume that things are broadly, that those things are taken care of. Of course. The basic conditions and pay are taken care of and are comparable at least. 
So the issue then, I suppose, is, um, and this, uh, I've got some students here who are, are researching, um, you know, the, the values of uh, the extent to which millennial, the millennial generation, it, it seems um, more explicitly concerned with value, purpose, and meaning in their lives. Yeah. It's interesting. There were some generation mm -hmm. shifts. So there's something about what does, what, what does the work for? In what ways does my work contribute to a larger purpose that satisfies me? Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's a significant uh, role uh, for those in leadership positions to really think about and to make those connections for real. And that may mean not just telling a story. It may mean radically changing the practices of the of the organization. Mm. So I'll give you an example. Again, yeah. one which I, I quote in the book. Uh, I was invited some years, some years ago to go and talk to or work with a group of senior partners and a big a big consulting company. I won't say which one it was, but it was one of the bigger ones. Okay. And their managing partner came in to give them the, the pep talk, and I sat at the back of them and listened to this. And the message was, our mission, because they knew they had to have a mission, was two in two. That was the thing. And when, when we unpicked it, the mission was this. Their current revenues were one and a half billion pounds a year, and in two years, they wanted them to be two billion pounds a year. That was it. That was the entire mission statement. It was the entire. No, purpose. I forgot about this one. Oh my god, this Isn't is so it interesting. Bad. And so <laughs> when I was talking to the other partners, they, you know, in a sense they bought into it, but not in, not in a hearts and minds way. Yeah. They said this is the, this. so. They a lot of the conversation was really interesting in in the coffee breaks, the bits of conversation between them that were here were about. Yeah, in five years' time, I will have enough to retire. Oh. You know, they were, they were calculating this in a very transactional way. There wasn't a sense of contributing to something useful. Now, that's, that's not just about a story or a message or a purpose. That's something about the way that the organization is aligned, the way that business is conducted, structure, reward, all that counts. Yeah. With that said, how do we articulate it? How do you find a way of articulating a sense of purpose? And I think the most helpful way of, of, of that, rather than the rather grand mission, vision, values, which it became a kind of orthodoxy and also a kind of oppression. Yeah. You know, I'm the new chief exec. Here are our values. Excuse <laughs> me. I, I had different, you're telling me I should have, these are my values now? Oh, okay. You know, it's, it's just laughable, really. That's, that's good. <laughs> there is something about, I think, the people in that role standing up and saying this is why i'm here uh-huh this is what it means to me and um, and to find the genuine point of connection and frankly if they can't find the genuine point of connection away do something else i've got no time for that it's not about creating a story that is an artificial pretense it's what's the real story so when i've worked with people in that in that situation and again there's a story in in, in telling the story i tell the story um about about the guy who was the head of um, the big HMRC, you know, the tax and and, and revenue. Place. Oh yeah, the David, David yeah, the ghost of David Varney, you know. Yeah, and that was his situation. He needed to be able to say, not what are we, not what are you here for, but what am I here for? And we, you know, the work was digging down. The telling of the story was the the least difficult part. It was finding it. It was finding. Uh, a moment he could talk about that was illustrative of the reason he was there. And if you remember from the book, it was, you know, it came from a childhood experience where, um, and he came from a humble background, but walking one day with his father in Docklands in the immediate aftermath of, in London, in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War, where it was literally, literally a bomb site, you know, craters and rubble. And his father saying to him, you know, one day, David, we will build a country where there are hospitals and schools and roads and facilities for everyone and he you know him saying this is why i'm here because we collect the money that makes that possible it was so simple yeah. so obviously heartfelt it was all over this organization in 12 hours an organization of a hundred thousand people wow and from, and from not having a clue why this guy was there to oh i see i get it now and then there's a bit of them that can say actually i do this i do something like that 
but I think it comes from the example rather than, and, and it has to be connected to the person. It's not about a clever story. That's spin. Uh, and there are folk who do that, but I'm not interested in it. I'm interested mm -hmm. in helping people do the hard work to mine down. That, that's the roots of the tree. That's the roots of the tree. It's like, what, am I, what do I care about and why am I bringing myself to this work? Mm -hmm. I, I, for me, can't say for everyone, for me, that's deeply inspiring. Yeah. Because it's, I can see that this person is, is and they found a way to manifest that in the work that they're doing. And I think that's wow. the heart of it. I think that's the heart of it. Finding um, the story. Yeah. yeah, that's that's powerful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I imagine that obviously people hearing that story, they uh, it, it makes it resonance. It makes a resonance yeah. inside them. So it makes them stay because they are seeing themselves in this person. And they maybe or is it is it? I think it opens up the possibility. It, it, it encourages is a different kind of conversation about them. So maybe just a hypothesis, uh, a leader telling his story of why he is here, truly the, the deep one, and then launching into a story circle where his team shares the stories that may like may be connected. <clears throat> is that a good way to start this conversation? Um, as simply as possible. <laughs> and in numbers, uh, uh, Rather than the grand lecture hall presentation, you know, no, no, just a small group. Small way doing it, and a big organisation. How do you how do you connect with people? Well, that's part of it. I, th I think uh, I've also worked with um, I worked with the chief executive of one of our big uh, banks here, and ended up um, at the National Exhibition Centre, which houses a thousand people. So each, you know, each over two days. And so he's got to somehow connect with an audience of a thousand people. Mm -hmm. And he was telling simple personal stories, not the kind of grandiose story or heroic story of, you know, we will march into the future together, but stories of, you know, of his struggle and um, his ambition and his, his sometimes failings to achieve them. And it was very moving in, in, in a simple way. You know, a simple mm. human way. So I, but I, I'm thinking of um, uh, an example comes to mind. A friend of mine, Australian uh, storyteller who works in business, uh, about using storytelling to um, share strategy in uh, strategic direction. Yeah. So they were looking to, to do an organizational transformation, and he worked with the chief exec and board so that they were able to connect in the same way we talked about with David Varney and his story. They found their own stories, mm. points of connection. Then they went out to their parts of the organization and began to introduce some of those stories in a way that then invited other people to find their stories and to listen mm. to them. So there's this kind of reciprocity. And I think that organic, I, I'm, I'm very suspicious of several things. One of them is this notion of cascading which is a typical kind of internal communication model. You know, you, the boss tells the story to that level. They tell the story to that level. You know, by the time you get two levels away, it's gone. You know, it's diluted and it's, and it's disconnected and it's impersonal and nobody believes it. Yeah. So I think we need to find other more organic ways of sharing and spreading stories, mm -hmm. uh, which make life more complicated for the internal communications people. But <laughs> hey, you know, who minds about that? <laughs> yes, it's their job. It's their job. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. So, you know, their job more is about yeah. It's less about having the message and telling it, and cascading it, and measuring who you know this sort of stuff, which is a very clunky way of thinking about communication. It's more about opening up different kind of spaces, different communicative spaces in which people can explore, question, doubt, imagine, dream, um, challenge. Yeah. And that's that's a good way to find a personal story. I used this method for one of my conferences. Uh, we had several speakers who were up to speak about wellness and well-being. And uh, before before the participants came to the hall where the speeches were held, they were in this like uh, you know uh, place with food, and there were the portraits of the speakers. And next to each portrait, there was a QR code. 
Uh, so, and we, when you scan the QR code, you can watch the video of the speaker telling his story about this topic. So basically, Brilliant. they came- That's a lovely device. Lovely device. I love Thank that. I should we, that's, uh, I'll that one. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. We used it as, uh, as a tool for insurance company and uh, to, to trigger the discussions in the break to like to help the brokers okay. talk with the clients about the wellness and well-being and it w- made a huge impact so yeah I, I i now see after you're saying this of the process of meaning making and cascading i now understand this this, this instrument which we intuitively uh, designed was just bringing people closer together thank you so much it just gave me the ground to stand on thank you jo- yeah, Jeff- sounds like a really good process <laughs> yeah oh just Take it away. I, I, would, I would love to hear your story about using it. It, <laughs> it would be lovely. Um, Jeff, to tell the truth, I have two more <laughs> questions. And they are okay. my traditional questions, which I uh, pose to all storytellers I come across. The first one would be, uh, what would be your advice for, I would say, a leader who wants to develop his storytelling skills? What would, he, what would you advise him to do? Um, Just one thing. I would say you have to find a backstage space. Backstage space. So what I mean by yeah, yeah. Well, what I what I mean by that is that if you're going to a, a, a that kind of a set piece story, the kind of set piece story is a performance. It's an authentic performance, and you yeah. you if you want to improve your storytelling, you need to practice, and mm. you you need to do that. Some of that where the stakes aren't high. Mm-hmm. So I think you have to you have to make the time in the space. You have to find people who you can work with, and you have to try the stories out. Mm. Do you know uh, Martin Luther King's great speech? Yeah. Uh, you know the, the I had a dream speech. Yeah. He tried bits of that out elsewhere. Hmm. You know, the, these great these great orators, these great speakers, great storytellers don't emerge bang fully formed. There's all sorts of work behind the scenes to do that. And someone who wants to tell stories in that position, well, has to do the work. Uh, you know, I think we all have the capacity to tell stories because it's, we're the storytelling animal. We can't not tell stories. But to, to learn to do it really well, there's a bit of technique that you can learn. But the best thing of all is to try stories out, rehearse, mm. practice, get some feedback. Mm-hmm. And then when you tell a story, you have to kind of let all that go mm. and be present with your group. The most important thing is, to, is how you show up. Well, I had a great lesson when I was on my storytelling training uh-huh. uh, for my this teacher of mine that I talk, talked to you about, Ashley Ramsden. Every morning when we came into class, he gets to do this exercise. A little bit of story that we knew, we'd stand in a circle and you imagine that one member across was the audience. We all did this at the same time. And you begin by telling this bit of story and you'd lean forward physically to the point where you were almost falling forward. And then you would lean back until it almost to the point where you were falling back. Mm-hmm. And then you'd find your center of gravity and you'd tell it from there. And this is both a kind of literal thing, but a metaphorical thing. It's like if you are, as you're telling the story, if you are leaning forward into the story, you are trying to think what comes next. In other words, you're trying to remember the story and, and plug it into place. Yeah. If you're leaning backwards metaphorically, you're kind of thinking, what did I just say? Did that sound all right? Was that all right? You're judging the story. Oh, and you have, beautiful. What you need to do is be there with the story genuinely there with the story and it it's a knack I, you there's not a way of just saying this is how you do it you have to do it and do it and do it yeah great and that's you get this way of being with story i remember yeah that's that's how you do it but it does take take work and and time and eventually there comes a point where you're not worried that you'll forget the story because you're not trying to remember the words you know what the story is mm-hmm. and you you know there's no point worrying about what you just said it's gone all you can do is be present now with the story with yourself and with your audience 
And that mean, that counts for so much. How you show up means far more than any technical aspect of storytelling. People are very forgiving of making a mistake, of fluffing, of forgetting. But they're not forgiving of people who are clearly um, hiding or somewhere else or two-dimensional or closed or shut off. Yeah. So show up. Show up is the, how you show up is the most important thing, I'd say. Great. So we have like two advices in a row. So yeah. practice, yeah. And practice, one of, one practice of, yes. and show yes. up. Because the practice, practice, practice enables you to let go of everything. Yeah. You're not worried. You know, it's not about practice. Remember every word. It's about getting comfortable with the story, trying it out so that you're, you, you can embellish on your feet. And then you can, when you go in, it's like acting. You know, I, I, I happen to know a little bit, not very well, but I know Sir Mark Rylance, who's a great Shakespearean actor. Mm -hmm. uh, and I talked to him one day. I was fascinated. I said, how do you do it, Mark, that you, because I've seen him on stage a dozen times. Yeah. I said, it just, I've seen him with Shakespeare, you know, I said, I, I would, don't think I could ever be an actor because I would be telling somebody else's words. They have to be in the right order at the right time, exactly right. I said, how do you do that? And, and it's so fresh. He said, I, I learn my lines so well that I can forget them. Oh, so when I'm, when I'm great. On, when I'm on stage, the words come out of my mouth as if I'm freshly saying them. Wow. Isn't that brilliant? That's, that's authentic brilliant. performance. That, that's letting it all go. It's doing the work, letting it go so you can show up because you haven't got the baggage of worrying about the story. Wow. That's just an insight for me. That's this, mm. this phrase. I, I love those golden phrases that just in, include so much with the wisdom. Mm. Learn the lines until you forget them. Great. Great. Thank you. That's, that's yeah. a great answer. Yeah. Mm. Okay, um, Jeff, final question in my favorite of yes. all, to tell the truth. Uh, <laughs> I want you to finish the phrase, which goes like this. Mm. If there was one thing that made a good story into a great story, what would that one thing be? Or that one thing would be? I think it, you have to find your point of connection with the story. So I, I, I don't think it's about I, on paper, I couldn't necessarily analyze. I could do lots of technical stuff about what's a good story and a constructing story. And, you know, there's lots of stuff around that. But in the moment of hearing a story, and I specialize in, in speaking stories rather than writing them. You know, I can write them, I do write them, but oral storytelling, people standing up and telling a story is what I'm really interested in. Mm -hmm. The thing that I think makes most difference and enables people to tell their story well and for it to be a great story or received as a great story is for the person who's telling it to find their point of connection with it. So a great story moves us, uh, but it will only move us if the person who's telling it can find the place in them that is moved by it. Mm. You mean now, physically, like in the body? I mean in the body, yeah, find that place, or in their imagination, or in their heart. So I, I'll give you an example. I tell a story, again, it's in the book. I've told it many, many, many times. The story of Vinoba Bave. Oh, yeah. The land reform movement. It's a yeah. wonderful story. Yes. I have told that story so many times I could tell it in my sleep. But if I did that, it would never work. Every time I tell that story, I am moved by it. I yeah. have to, because I, in, I try to inhabit the world of the story as I tell it, such that I feel it fresh every time. And that, I think, is the key. People love the story, not because of the technical way I tell it. They love lots of things about what happened, and, and, and it was technically it's a good story. But the reason it lands, I think, every time is because it lands with me every time. Mm. You're moved I, by it. Uh, yes. I mean, I, I, I move differently than the audience because I know what the story is. It's not a surprise, you know. Um, but somehow there's a part of me that is touched by that person's generosity of soul every time I tell the story. Mm. And I think, I think if I ever lose that connection, I'll just have to stop telling the story. You know, storytelling performers, and I don't, I, I perform for fun, you know, or for charity events. I'm not a professional performer. Those people who are sometimes have to tell lots and lots, you know, the story to over and over and over and over again. They get to a point where, they've lost that point of connection. 
they have to let that story go. Maybe they can come back to it in a year's time. But you should, if you get stale, that, that's the challenge. You know? That's the challenge for Mark Rylance as an actor. is not going on stage the first night and doing that. Mm-hmm. Going on stage every night and doing that. Yeah, that's a challenge. That's, a, that's, yeah. a good, that's a good advice to feel. You know, I, I'm, I'm listening to you and I'm recalling this amazing clip by Nike, which is uh, the last game. Uh, it's, it's an anima- animation for like five minutes. And like the plot is quite simple. Uh, one engineer comes up with the clones, which replace all the players. And uh, like over time, those clones are so perfect that they replace all the players and they're all oh. just wearing... You, have you seen it? No, I haven't, no. So, and basically, all the players that like Cristiano Ronaldo, Rooney, they are just out of play. And the football gets so boring that no one ever wants to yeah, see it. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah. Ronaldo, the, the, like the old guy, he collects different players, like the, the top figures, like Neymar Jr., like yeah. uh, uh, Rooney himself, like Cristiano Ronaldo. And so, so they're all connected. And then he goes like, uh, they are, you're playing like it's a game and they play like it's a job. And there is no greater danger than playing it safe. And they yeah. go out on the field as, a, like, as a one final ma- match. And yeah. uh, there is this theme, like whoever first scores takes it all and the other team just quits. And in the critical moment, the, the ball was, is rolling towards the, our goal. And the, the defender, I, I guess it was Puyol or so, someone from Brazil, he hears those words. And instead of running with the ball from the goal, he runs to the line and off the line, he quips the ball. And they just start going mayhem, like tricks and stuff and flips and, you know, just going crazy. And I'm so moved every time. Like, now I'm telling it, I just feel it in my throat and the ears come, like the tears come. I don't know why it's so powerful with me, but it's so moving. And they obviously, they beat the the guys. But, I mean, wow, that's just the Mm. the, the clip of my dreams. But it's not Mm. like that for everyone. And yeah. I feel the resonance with what you're saying. Yeah, but the clip might not be like that for everyone, but your connection with it is palpable. So I'm hearing the story of you watching the clip. And that touches me. Wow. Because you're touched by it. Wow. Thank you. I, I, I love to hear that you're touched by mm. it. Thank you so mm. much. Jeff, this is this was really amazing. Thank you so much for your time. Just to you're sum it up. Welcome. Can you give some context of yours, like shortly, how can people around here find you on the web? Okay, so I have a few presences on the web. Um, my professional presence is called Coming Home to Story. No, sorry. My blog is called comminghometostory.com. Yeah. That's a personal blog. My, my dog writes many of those blogs. That's dog? Just how it works. Yeah, yeah, my dog writes. <laughs> <laughs> So, oh, okay. I, that's that's just for fun, and then my and my kind of fiction and poetry and writing find their way there because I write all of that. Stuff. <laughs> okay. My professional blog is called narrativeleadership.com. Okay. Uh, that's that's my business, and it's a kind of virtual consulting group. I have people who work with me, and there's quite a lot of material on there about our approach. I also run a little not for profit. And if you're in the UK next year in June, you'd be very welcome to come because every couple of years mm. we run a, a small gathering. I won't even call it a conference of about 30 to 40 people who are interested in this field. Uh-huh. And just to kind of develop the field and our thinking in different areas. So we have a, next year, the theme is stories that heal. And that oh, is narrativeleadership.org. Wow. Okay, both of them. So Yeah, narrativeleadership.com is the professional one, narrativeleadership.org is the uh, not-for-profit uh, one. And you can contact me uh, through either of those websites. Wow, I just, I just added both of them to my uh, favorites in the yeah. Google. So, yeah. And if, you, and if you like stories written by dogs or fiction or poetry or stuff and are curious, then go to Coming Home to Story. Okay, okay. I, I, I added it too. So, yeah, I, I'll, that's a whole different story. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole different story. Okay, Jeff, thank you so much once again for your time and I wish you all all the great stories to come. And you and do keep in touch and do send me links to your channel. And uh, if our paths should cross, that would be wonderful. Of course. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye bye.